beyond rotten apples and broken windows. The massive demonstrations rocking U.S. cities from coast to coast are loud and visible reflections of the deep anger and antipathy rising up against the long and bloody train of police terrorism. If you have read my writings or listened to my commentaries, you know that I describe police violence as what it is, terrorism, not brutality. For the aim of all police violence is to instill terror in black populations just as was the aim of white terrorists of the past, like the Ku Klux Klan, which lynched black men, women, and yes, children. And although these protests by young people across the country are remarkable, we must remember that cop violence against African-American communities ain't a new thing. It was December 4th, 1969, 45 years ago, when cops raided the Monroe Street apartment building of young Black Panthers, including Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton of Chicago, Illinois. There, police, armed with submachine guns, shot Captain Mark Clark of Peoria, Illinois, and Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton as he slept in his bed next to his pregnant wife. Both Mark and Fred were killed. At least seven other Panthers were wounded by police gunfire, as they laid in their beds. Not a single cop was ever charged with these murders or the aggravated assaults on members of the Black Panther Party. Next spring marks the 30th anniversary of the MOVE bombing, where cops dropped bombs from a helicopter and killed 11 men, women, and children, members and relatives of the black naturalist group MOVE, 11 people, burned and or shot to death, and two city blocks in Philadelphia turned to red bricks and ashes. And again, not a single cop ever even charged with anything. Only MOVE member Ramona Africa would ever go to jail, prison I should say, for riot for seven years. The movement protesting police terrorism is a remarkable thing, but it didn't begin yesterday. Police terrorism is decades long, and it ain't about rotten apples or broken windows. It's about blocking a popular freedom movement and protecting a system of repression. From Imprisoned Nation, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio. For shizzle dizzle, we got an excellent show here today. But first, I want to say the views and opinions that of the Comcast does not affect this staff, is associates, or affiliates. With that being said, we do discretion is advised, and that opinions of Black Sun does not affect that of the arena. Take that, Amy Goodman. <laughs> it's an inside joke. With that being said, all things censored. But before we start the show, I want to introduce the guest to my right, starting to my right. Introduce yourself. My name is Diane Mathowitz. I'm a member of Workers World Party, and I'm the local coordinator of the International Action Center. And I'm a former uh, state, um, I don't know what I was, a coordinator of a Mumia Defense Committee here in the state of Georgia back in the late 90s. I'm Dawn. OK. <laughs> That's my turn. Dawn, yeah. um, my name is Dawn Gibson. Um, I am a member of the Georgia Peace and Justice Coalition here in Atlanta. Um, I am also a volunteer at WRFG. Um, my entrance into Mumia was some organizing around Troy Davis. Oh, wow. And okay. so, um, so they were screening a film to use Mumia's case to connect with Troy's. All right. Okay. Jensen Cheeks, music and TV show host, actor, and activist. Mm -hmm. Man, Yang and Kruma, happy to be here, you know, always. Looking forward to the conversation. All right, all right. Okay, who, who wants to start this thing up? All right. Let's give a little history. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna give a little background on Mumia uh, for the young people out there who may not know. Um, he is a political prisoner of the United States. Um, on July 3rd, 1982, he was convicted and sentenced to death for the December 9th, 1981 murder of a Philadelphia uh, police officer named Daniel Faulkner. 
Uh, there was a lot of controversy surrounding the case. Uh, Mumia says he didn't kill the officers. The right. state says that he did. The state side of the story is that Mumia's brother, uh, William Cook, had yes. got pulled over um, by, by Daniel Faulkner, and there were gunshots. Mumia says he ran over there to the situation. He was parked across the street in his cab. He says he runs over. He got shot by Daniel Faulkner. Um, the conflict starts with the state saying Mumia killed the officer, and Mumia saying he didn't. It was somebody. It was another <coughs> shooter. There. Okay. But nobody else was ever presented as a possible shooter. And then there was this farce of a trial put on for Mumia, and he was falsely convicted of having killed the cop. The state says that two police officers in a in a black security, a black female security guard at the hospital heard Mumia say, yeah, I shot the MFR and I hope the MFR dies right. when they brought him to the hospital. Um, and so that was a big part of their case. Okay. And so from there, he spent the first 30 years in prison on death row. Right. Um, he was in solitary confinement, confinement most of the time he was locked up. Uh, his sentence was commuted from the death penalty to life with no parole right. in December of 2011. And it was commuted based on the fact that there were so many irregularities and in inconsistencies mm -hmm. in his trial. So, but they won't grant him a, a new trial. They won't grant him they a new trial. They will not grant him a new trial. And so that's where we are now. He's been in jail since 1981, 82. Um, he's been an activist from prison. And so now, they're trying to take away his rights. And you might ask, how do you take away someone's rights who's already in prison? Mm -hmm. We're gonna get into that. They passed this new legislation called the Revictimization Relief Act, which means that they're trying to, Mumia has a, a prison radio program where he talks about social and political issues from prison. Right. And so this act, that they, this legislation that they just passed is saying that his commentary is re-victimizing the officer's widow, Maureen Faulkner. Interesting. And so now they're trying to pull the plug on his prison radio program and what have you. So that's his current fight, uh, trying to stay on the air, trying to keep his voice heard. And so we can get into the topic of why <laughs> does the state and the country have such animosity and angst? Mm. for Mumia Abu-Jamal. Mm. So, mm. um, and the Revictimization Relief Act is basically, uh, it's a law aimed at silencing those convicted of crimes and those who publish their speech <coughs> um, for the most part. Um, his lawyer, Brett Grote of the Abolitionist Law Center, is saying that it's, it violates the First Amendment of the mm -hmm. Constitution. Right and they are grossly <laughs> overstepping their boundaries, which we all know that the United States government mm -hmm. tends to do sometimes. No. I, I think that's a good question. Let's go back to the what you said. <coughs> why, and let's ask, you know, uh, Diana, Donna, start or whoever would like to answer this. Why so much hate? Why so much fear of Mumi Abu-Jamal? Is, is it something that he represents? Is it, you know, why this big, you know, the whole thing to keep him silenced and to, uh, to take the little voice that he had that he had why is that or why do you think it is I'll jump in well you know it, uh, he he actually joined the Black Panther Party when he was a teenager right I think 14. and um, he's actually been a victim of surveillance and counterintelligence program Pro. Mm -hmm. uh, activities from the age of 15 um, so from from when his uh, in his very young youth, being a member of the Black Panther Party, which of course was a subject of intense hostility by every government agency in this country, which included assassination and all kinds of uh, devious and underhanded, and, and there are so many Black Panther members, Black Panther Party members who are still in prison mm -hmm. 30 and 40 years mm -hmm. later. So okay, so you start there. Why are they so hostile to him? Right. Because at such a young age, he already had made it clear that he was a political activist 
he was in support of black people. Mm. You know, the phrase Black Lives Matter. Mm. Mumia and the Panthers were talking <laughs> about Black Lives Matter mm. right. uh, a long right. time ago. Um, okay, so then he goes on uh, to become this accomplished journalist. Right. He actually becomes the president of once the Philadelphia left, once he left the Panthers. Association of Black Journalists. Mm. Um, he has radio shows. He becomes active in support of the MOVE uh, organization. Mm, that's right. mm -hmm. There, again, another organization that the Philadelphia powers that be, you know, went after to the extent of actually bombing <laughs> right. an entire city bombing block. Their, bombing mm -hmm. their no, 50 city blocks is what it destroyed when they bombed, wow. when they bombed the MOVE headquarters. Mm -hmm. And killing women and children mm -hmm. right. and, and all the rest. So, so, okay, so you go it is this progression, and he continually appears on the state's list mm -hmm. of those that are able to both mobilize, educate, inspire mm -hmm. people. All right, so now you have him in prison. 30 years on death row, I'm sure the state thought, we got him. Right, you right, know. right. But no, right, Mumia right. has written books. Mm -hmm. They have been published in nine languages. We have a few of them here on the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he has uh, written essays, 3,000 of them. He's on radio. So despite, you know, you, you just can't even imagine the torture of literally being in solitary confinement with virtually no, no human touch right, in right. 30 years that he still maintains such an incredible sense of humanity, such courage, mm. such compassion, and such an incredible <coughs> intellect. Right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Incredible intellect. Mm -hmm. So this is not the first time the state of Pennsylvania has tried to has Muslim Mumia. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Don, you want to jump in? Well, when I think about um, how dangerous Mumia is, I think about my education as a black woman in this country. Mm. Um, when I think about you know how we've been educated, uh, sort of like how we perceive movements in the past, and I think this heavily influences how movements are today. So basically, you know, Rosa Parks, you know, she was this older woman who sat down. Martin Luther King stood up, said a speech, and then everything was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't talk about Fred Hampton's murder. We right. didn't talk right. about what happened afterwards. We didn't talk about you know, even King himself being murdered because he was being more vocal right. about the Vietnam War, about <coughs> issues of class and mm. stuff like that. So I feel like what happens with a lot of us because of integration, and this is not saying that I'm against integration, but I come from a family that is very assimilationist. Yeah. And right. so basically in that in assimilationist mode, you're trying to, what is it, they think black people are threatening? Try not to be threatening at all. Yeah. And so and yeah. so basically yeah. Black Panthers that becomes a joke of the past that becomes mm -hmm. of something, you know, we don't need that now. Yeah. We right. had Martin Luther King yeah. and now everything yeah. is fine. Yeah. Except that, you know, these these evil Black Panthers <laughs> have to have talked about capitalism, talked about, you know, the violence of the state and everything else, but I think that when you're trying to be upwardly mobile as a, a, you know, trying to actually believe that now that things are equal, people like Mumia make you uncomfortable. Right. And Mumia, ha, Mumia does not, Mumia is not just in prison writing books, you know, just sitting around just going, I think I just want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. He is keeping track mm -hmm. and keeping in touch with what's right. going on in the right. world right. and has mm -hmm. been commenting on that. Um, it was a sad shame, and I have to say that I don't know why I was judging because I didn't even know who Mumia was until like maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I used to teach uh, technical college, and, and occasionally I would play prison radio mm -hmm. you know, snippets mm -hmm. you know, so that we can stimulate some conversation, and that would translate into composition. But most people didn't know about Mumia. Yeah. They don't know about Mumia. Yeah. They don't know about you know what how Mumia got in there. You know somebody on death row. That's something that's regular, mm -hmm. and so I feel like, you know, also Mumia symbolizes he's he's in prison, he's wrongfully in prison, right. and he's in prison <clears throat> because of a racist, you know, system right. that you know conspired to put him in there, mm -hmm. and I also think that even highlighting Mumia now, you know, especially since there's a spotlight on the police. 
and that finally some serious things are being okay, talked about. Right. Now <laughs> I believe that we need to highlight Mumia. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I uh, the reason I feel like they're going against him so hard is basically for two reasons, mm -hmm. um, and it's the two things that I don't know why the government fears the most, and that's one, he's a black man. Mm -hmm. Two, he's a black man telling the truth. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he's out there telling the truth yeah. about the government and the atrocities that mm -hmm. were going on in mm -hmm. the '50s, '60s, and mm -hmm. '70s. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened, what I believe happened when they falsely uh, convicted him, I really think they thought, as with most cases, they were going to break his spirit. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they thought he was going to get in there, know he was on death row mm -hmm. wrongly, and just fold and collapse. Mm -hmm. And he didn't. He has done nothing but grown consistently stronger yeah. mm -hmm. from the day that they put him in there. Mm -hmm. And they can't wrap their heads around it. Yeah. Not only that, the worldwide support that this man has is mm -hmm. unbelievable. And I'm gonna just give a list, list of things that he's done. This is since he's been in prison, Right. Thanks. okay? Uh, he's been made an honorary citizen of about 25 cities around the world, including Copenhagen, Montreal, and Paris. Paris even named a street after him. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Back in 2006, which caused a lot of ire in the US mm -hmm. government. Congress, uh, yeah. Who was it? Michael Fitzpatrick and Rick Santorum. Right. They filed two criminal complaints in the French in the French legal system <laughs> against the city of Paris <laughs> municipalities, <laughs> accusing them of glorifying mm -hmm. Mumia Abu Jamal. So and so he has that support. Amnesty International, they haven't really said anything for or against his innocence or guilt, but they have looked at his trial and they have said that he was unfairly tried and he mm -hmm. deserves to have a retrial but yet Philadelphia refuses to give him another retrial. He has the support of the Congressional Black Caucus, NAACP, from uh, politicians in France, Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, Nobel laureates such as Nelson Mandela, Toni Morrison, Desmond Tutu, European and Japanese parliaments. I mean, like, yes. there's people mm -hmm. all over the world that is drawn to this man. And they don't understand, given the fact that they have wrongly convicted him, they've torn apart his character mm -hmm. and his manhood, mm -hmm. only, the, the only way that America knows how, and he's still standing and he's still fighting from prison. The man had, we got six books yeah. right. on the table right now <laughs> that, from him approach. talking. Mm -hmm. And they don't want him to talk anymore because people are still listening. Yeah. They've been listening for right. over 30 years. Yeah. And how? Okay, ahead, I want to touch on because you said the victim uh, re re revictimization relief act. Right. So um, Mumia's law is what they call it. Mumia's law, and what I'm kind of confused about is every single commentary is not about Mumia. Right. So right. how is this, um, Don? How is this? Uh, t I guess terrorizing the victim is what mm -hmm. I want to know. Um, well, I, I think uh, I think maybe to go back a little bit. Um, the context of this law coming out, you know, he was invited to give an, an address at a, at a right. high school graduation. Not high school. It was College. 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 Yeah. Goddard. Sorry. Goddard. Goddard. Sorry. Goddard College in Vermont. Yeah. Which would be a graduated from. Right. He's an in alumni. Right. Okay. okay. So, hmm. I, I am definitely sympathetic to victims having to see the face of their attackers and stuff. Okay. Unfortunately, this law didn't seem to come around while, you know, Zimmerman is, is making his bucks right, right. after yeah. having been acquitted for murdering mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin. Um, however, um, Mrs. Faulkner, um, you know, I guess, you know, this law is to pr protect her. <clears throat> I, you know, I, I really don't believe, ev I don't believe that this law is being put in place in the spirit that it's putting, being put placed in. I don't think mm. that this has anything to do with, the state has not really done much to help the victimization of mm. women. You know, right. like okay. th that's, not, that's not what this, this state is like. I mean, we're talking about a country where, you know, a lot of women, you know, if they call the police to help in a domestic violence, you know, uh, dispute, they themselves can be beaten, shot, or arrested by the police. Right. Maybe, you know, all mm -hmm. three. Right. 
And so this particular law makes it look like, you know, he's trying to protect the women, but really what this is trying to do is silence it's Mumia, silence. especially <coughs> during these times. I mean, this, mm -hmm. you know, this is not, this law is not coming out of nowhere. This right. isn't separate from everything else, you know. People are challenging the state, asking questions, saying mm -hmm. certain things. And so our most controversial intellectuals about to get, I have to tell you, I wish that I was graduating from Goddard, <laughs> and I wish I was there. You know, I mean, like some other people, they had to put up with, you know, other, t you know, they had to have somebody else as as a um, as a speaker. Mumia, like, I'm sorry, Mumia is a very powerful speaker. Mm -hmm. Mumia also thinks about things in detail, right. and can you imagine? I, I can imagine. I mean, I remember what I was like during my first college graduation. You know, I have a, I have a couple gradu graduations. And I know that we were all, we had all been partying the night before. And so I can imagine hearing Mumia, even at, like, it's not going to be boring. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they know I, that. I think to me, the whole thing, that's what it, that's what it is to me. It's not just, um, you know, first of all, free our beautiful brother, Mumia right. Abu-Jamal. Free Mumia. Right, free, free Mumia. Mumia. <laughs> Mumia. Mumia. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I think that it speaks to a bigger issue, and I think that it's like what we were talking about with Ferguson, with Mike Brown, with Eric Garner, and I always say that it's about a collectiveness. Right. It's right. about collectivism. You see, as long as they can make it Mike Brown, an isolated incident, mm -hmm. then it's just this one black brother that got killed by a white police officer. Right. If they can make it Eric Garner. Right. But it doesn't speak to the systematic targeting of African people mm -hmm. here in America being murdered and not right. finding any type of... Uh, relief through a judicial system. We already know what that's about. So I think this is what it, I think this is what it is with Mimi Abu Jamal. I think that he speaks to bigger issues. Right. You know what I'm saying? He speaks right. to a bigger issue. He speaks to uh, the African revolution taking that has taken place and is still taking place here in America. Right. He speaks about the ills of, of capitalism. He speaks about just everything that is affecting us as African people in America, and not just as Af and not just on a civil rights issue, right. but taking it to an internationalism. Global, yeah. On a global issue. And that type of that type of global support that he's garnishing and that's coming together. And so when you free if you free a man or if you let a man uh, speak like that, I think that one of the things that they do fear is that they fear that the African uh, man, woman here in America will actually start to wake the hell up and realize that it is bigger than a civil rights issue. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? That our human rights are being violated, right. that we have to come together with solidarity with revolutionaries, that we have to, that our revolution has to evolve to internationalism. Correct. And we have to come together in solidarity with all the revolutionaries worldwide trying to shake these shackles of imperialism and, and these mm -hmm. other beasts that hold us down off our back. And I think that that's what Mumia Abu Jamal speaks to, and especially from coming from you know a people who have been systematically oppressed. One of our own is not Mao. It's not mm -hmm. you know Marx and Lenin. Not knocking any of them. This is Mumia. This is like the right. homie from the hood. <laughs> right, you know, right, right. Right. This is a, you know, and and I get out there. I keep it real. This is a brother. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We read the other greats, and everybody has their great. Like I said, we got right. Mao, and we got you know what I'm saying. We read our Che's, and we read our Marx and our Engels, and this and that. But now we got Mumia, and I think that that's to me. That's what that speaks to. It's like oh smack. A black man, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh it's on one of these, yeah. on on a level of like this, and that he has, he is seeing through this thing, and he has the potential Not to only lead his people to a black man, but a black nationalist guy. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Jagger, who would be rolling yeah. over in his Roll grave? Over. Over. <laughs> <Game. laughs> Let me say this about the RRA, the Revictimization Relief Act. Mm -hmm. um, the RRA allows a crime victim to obtain injunctive and other relief, including reasonable attorney fees and other costs associated with litigation for conduct which perpetuates the continuing effect of the crime on the victim. So, by Mumia speaking, still being an activist, still being loved around the world, mm -hmm. this legislation is basically saying that he's re-victimizing her uh, by doing those things and profiting from, oh, I don't know if they let him profit from it, but they definitely, he's definitely getting his word out there. Mm -hmm. And so, but Maureen Faulkner, the widow, she stated that the only thing she wants is a confession. If he confesses to killing uh, Officer Daniel Faulkner, then she'll, she, she doesn't she care what he say. Right, she doesn't care what he say. But because, but because <laughs> he's not uh, showing remorse and confessing, she and her lawyers are saying that 
she's not getting closure, closure and therefore being re-victimized. Okay, and this is why last week, and I'm, I'm coming to you, Diane, that we talked about cameras and technology. Because based on what I saw from Long Distance Revolutionary, I saw a guy confessing, saying he did it. Oh, did and then kill, I have two witnesses officer? saying there was a third guy that shot when Mamiya was already down. There was a, a figure that ran away. Yeah. So I'm just saying, I want to, you know, Diane, I'm, I'm just, you know, with all the technology, you know, because, and I want to bring this up because the commissioner of New York, this guy is about in his, I don't know, he's older gentleman. Now me, I have 2020 vision, and what I saw Eric Garner being choked out, he said, "Well, technically, what you you didn't see, what he you saw. didn't see, why you, you, well, you didn't actually see a choke hold." Are you it talking wasn't... about Patrick Lynch? Yes, I am. That's the he's the president of the Police Benevolence uh, Organization in yes. New York. Yes, right. He so he's telling me he that, that it was not a choke hold. He said that uh, the officer had his arm under Eric Garner's. Right, armpit, armpit and right. then brought it around his neck, and I'm looking at the TV. Which is a chokehold. <laughs> right. No, but he no. The man had the man didn't come under his arm. He was clearly around Eric Garner's neck. But Patrick Lynch sat there and said, "I saw him in the interview." Oh, said at least five. Under. No, bro. He was he was not <laughs> under that man. I think he had a, but he <laughs> got this one around his neck. Come right. Up. He this was one under around his neck. the neck. No, he was is saying there was choking. But, but the point. Oh, the point. Was, it wasn't under his neck. Gentlemen, the point said he said, said, said I can't breathe. Oh, I mean, right. I don't is. know. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it's just me. I can't breathe. I can't can breathe. Right. I don't know. Right. So whatever, it could be this way, that way, right. this way. Right, couldn't breathe. The man point. couldn't breathe. Right, right. right. I'm yeah. just, I don't know. Now right. speaking English. For untaxed, right. capitalism at its front, for untaxed for, cigarettes. For capitalism. You know what I'm saying, right? 50 cent, cent cigarettes. can't tax their cigarettes, brother. You got to die. Right, <laughs> right. Because you know? you're taking so money right. out of government pocket. So but Diane, 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 yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we got to we got to set up. We took, <laughs> look, we took one of them back alleys I was telling you about earlier. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, so I we, knew it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where to jump in on this, but I, I, again, I do think um, the timing of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we have, uh, well, we have Eric Garner at the end of July, and then we have mm -hmm. Michael Brown the beginning of August. And then as you s have both mentioned, what seemed to have prompted the Pennsylvania legislature was this request from Goddard mm -hmm. that Mumia pre-record a commencement address. Right. And, and this is not the first time Mumia has, has been uh, asked to be a guest speaker at a commencement. Wait, wait, Diane, I, I gotta stop you right there. Okay. Goddard asked and requested Mumia to make the speech. So Mamiya just said, I want to make a speech. They went to him. Not, well, just, not, not just got it, the students. The students right, the students, right. For this speech. So let me get this straight. Look, yeah. As a result, <laughs> the school received a barrage of scornful press reports, hate laced phone and social media oh, course, messages. Right. And FOP. some of the faculty received death threats. From Ooh. the FOP, for Attorney Order Police. I don't know who the death threats came from, but oh, they okay. received yes. death threats because they did not want Mumia speaking. Yes. The views and opinions of that of Black Sun does not reflect <laughs> that of the arena. I just want to make that clear. But I think we can talk about the role of the Fraternal Order yes, of Police. Yes, please. Let's do that. that. Yes, please. because uh, this is, uh, and I will go ahead. I mean, this is like a terrorist organization that has recognition. Right. Um, and so they have been absolutely unequivocal, that's not a word, unequivocal, <laughs> uh, in their uh, intense hatred of Mumia. And mm -hmm. it goes, as I said, it goes back. Mm -hmm. It goes back to his role in the formation of the Black Panther Party mm -hmm. chapter mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. It goes to the, Move the uh, journalism, mm -hmm. the, re the interviews, the support he gave to Move and his opposition to what um, the government was doing in regard to that group of, mm -hmm. of black folks. Mm -hmm. It goes to, so he has been uh, on their list as one of the people they would love to get. Mm -hmm. And then from the trial there on, this so-called report by this cop that he heard Mumia as he was being wheeled in after right. being mm -hmm. critically hurt right. saying that, 
the doctors mm -hmm. who treated right. him right. said no, he was unconscious. Right. right. That, that was like there was also <laughs> a lot of blood in his lungs. Right. Not so, only so it was like so the falsehood. Right. Not the only falsehood. had he been shot, but the cop, the cops beat him on the way to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so the, mm -hmm. they said he was unconscious. So how could he admit to okay, shooting the MF? Like and, and I think there's also a claim that it wasn't even in the police report. It wasn't in the police right. report. Right. And then comes up later. Later when the crime starts. The black security female Priscilla. Yeah, Priscilla. Uh, what was her name? Durham? Yeah, Durham. She, Durham. Priscilla Durham recanted um, later on. So how Why do all these people recant after the fact? Mm. Well, just, that was... I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's in, tremendous oh. pressure. Well, yeah, it's, it's, tremendous pressure. It's, it's, it's a lot of tremendous pressure. I mean, you know, it's, it's like you've got these... Skills. You know, yeah, we're talking about the fraternal order of police. Right. Well, let's just talk about police. Period. Yeah, you right. know, well, it's quick. not like they're these friendly, you know, faces in our neighborhood. Well, well, let me, let me, <laughs> like, right, well, let me ask you real quick, because um, I know they have, in the wake of Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, you've had the um, black yeah, police uh, officers right. against police I'm brutality. Mm -hmm. What is their stand on Lamia? Because they talk all this good game about, you know, we, you know, we're against police brutality and we're black I've police never officers. Even heard of them. Right. Oh, you never heard of them? I've never heard of them. Oh, they've been on WRJ there. Yeah, no, I yeah, I have to say I am not sure whether what they have said about that. But we gonna have to get them on the ring. <laughs> but but it is clear that there have been black police who have you know um, broken the silence of the blue. Right. The really? Blue really? Yeah. Yeah. There have. And See, uh, I, I think what happens with the police is the police creates its own institute and it becomes a culture. Right. They have their own. They have their own culture. That's why I say this is, you know, I'm fighting America is so tricky because not only so, is it just a race when it's a class, when it's yeah. an institutional fight. That's yeah. right. You know, so we're fighting on a all union these fight, a right. union religious fight. fight. Right. So we're fighting yeah. on all these different levels. You know, because you, you know, and I first understood that. I mean, when I was in Cleveland, we were taught neo-colonialism, what I call nationally. Over here, I call it Uncle Tomism. So I would, we would talk Uncle Tomism and things of this nature, but I never saw it in effect until I moved to Atlanta. You know, because clearly our police in Cleveland, uh, a lot of them are Caucasian. So when all right, right, police, right, major right. About, they, their whole thing is the murder. Just ask, that, to, oh, ask Tamir Rice. That's Tamir it. Rice, right. Yeah, that's, and the views and opinions of Yanga. Don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, and the young father right, who, right. Also, who was murdered in, uh, in Walmart. In Walmart. Right, right, so, right. but when I moved to Atlanta and saw. Uh, Uncle Tomism at his highest degree when I saw black police officers in a lot of cases worse than the white like Ice Cube said in that yeah. black police slam you down to the uh, uh, street top black police showing, showing out for the white cop right, yeah you yep. know when I saw this firsthand, it shocked me and that's when I started to understand this whole institutional type of us against them mentality mm -hmm. so you know where do we fight from that and I think that even with this and that's a good question you ask where do these black officers stand and to go back with Momia that's what I mean I think with the whole Momia Abu Jamal thing it addresses all of these issues yeah. right. totally. and, and Yanga I'm not talking about oh excuse me I mean oh go ahead Don I'm, I was wanted to say to Yanga I'm not talking about whether Momia the, the political aspect, I'm just saying as far as facts are concerned, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But we know some police have been known I mean, to cover up facts. I'm about to say, <laughs> facts are subjective. Right. Yeah. I'm like, the police put the facts out that they want. The prosecutors back the police with the evidence that they want See, to present. That's why we're going to have Ask cop Bob watch McCullough. on the show, because we got mean, our own evidence now. How I about mean, that? We got our own. The same thing that happened to Mamiya as far as the farce of a trial, mm -hmm. leaving out evidence, planting mm -hmm. evidence, yeah. just being totally corrupt and crooked. The mm -hmm. same thing happened in the Mike Brown case. Mm -hmm. The prosecutor took evidence right. that he wanted to present right. to the jury. Mm -hmm. He slanted it. He spent. He spent it. He did whatever he wanted. Transparency. To do. Mm -hmm. and Open transparency. Got That's the police officer right. off. Why? Because police officer, prosecutor, yes, they're in bed together. Yeah. Glove right. hand in hand. Oh, I don't they, care they, who's they, in bed the together. Right. Um, <laughs> oh, good. So, Go ahead, what I was so what I was going to say about black police officers? Because I was going to say now I know you remember Boys in the Hood. Right. And right. I know you remember right. that scene oh, that, yeah. right outside where, right. that's yeah. right, <laughs> you know, James Baldwin yeah. even mentioned that, yeah. that yeah. a lot of times, you know, that's you know, take mm -hmm. your chances with the white cop because the black cop would be a little harder. Yeah. But here's an experience that I had, and, you know, so I'm wearing my I Am Troy Davis t-shirt. Right. I got this t-shirt um, uh, canvassing for Troy. And I was at the DeKalb the uh, Farmer's Market, 
and a police officer, black police officer, sees me. I forgot. Oh. I always forget what I'm wearing. Mm. <laughs> but then, you know, he comes up to me really quickly. <clears throat> now, I have to tell you, I was scared. Yeah. I was right, really scared. Right. Yeah. But he whispered in my ear. He's just like, I agree with your shirt. And so mm. that was a very interesting experience that he was it because I will also say that there were some actions that I participated in mm. around the mobilization where the cops left us alone. Mm. Okay. So I don't know what that means. You know, Troy Davis has you know, Troy Davis was also falsely accused of, of murdering a police officer. Mm. Seven out of nine witnesses recanted. Right. You know, we keep talking about why are these witnesses doing that and just like, you know, Systemically, you know, police. See, I, I know that there are institutions to find out what police are doing illegally, but we should actually really look to see what police can do legally. Yeah. Okay. Legally, yeah. they can lie to you. Mm -hmm. oh. They can lie long, yeah, that's what they do best. long and long and heavy. They can tell you, they can say, your mama came in here looking for you, mm -hmm. and your mama's in a different state. They can tell you all sorts of things. They can make up stuff, promise you all sorts of things, whatever. Right. They can legally do that. And that's not just the police. That's FBI, too. Yes. That's oh. why they say, don't yeah, talk to cops. Yeah. Don't, don't talk, talk to cops. You can't lie to police. Exactly. Right. So you. here you are. You want to go home. You just want to, you know, that's why some people say they don't want to exercise their rights because they feel like if they do, then they won't get out of the situation. So here you are. You're in this situation. And so there are these cops. They're trying to get something out of you. Hey, we'll let you go if you do this. Right. You right. know, this, right. there's no way this right. can happen. So that's how, so that's, I'm thinking that's how nine witnesses came forward to say that Troy Davis mm -hmm. murdered, you know, and that's how, you know, the same thing with Mumia, you know, they intimidated a woman into saying, hey, you know, this is what's going this on. And right. actually the moment she came forward and said this was not true, they were ready to arrest her. Yeah. So it's just like, you know, that's something that we need to see that happens in our system and identify that. And that black cops are complicit in that, too. Mm -hmm. But they're also in a they weird position. Be. They're also in a weird position because the uniform might still be blue. But the skin is still mm -hmm. black. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there has actually been recently a black cop shot, you know, within yeah. the past month or so. Yeah. You heard yeah. about black, that? Black yeah. 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 Two days ago. Oh, in the so, oh, the so, so it's a sort of like, you know, while you are acting as this, you are still vulnerable. Okay, so, and I know the uh, Supreme Court passed uh, legislation in, I think, 2005 saying that police are no longer here to protect, but just to enforce the law. So they're not here to protect us. Oh, yeah. That's been passed. So my, my question is, you know, and now, Don, you mentioned how uh, the police have an allegiance to their uniform but I mean the evidence I mean if the you know says that Eric Garner was choked out I mean you know but your police chief is saying well you actually what you didn't see choked. where do you Take draw down. the line between your uniform and reality is what I want to know because this oh. is what I have problems with organizations religions institutions is I I don't need nobody holding my hand black son you seem to have forgotten that four officers were let off the hook for beating Rodney King, and that was all on video. Mm, that's like, true. this is this is because business was, as usual. Resisting. This was business as just usual. Like, just like Eric Garner you know, would say he was How resisting. often do they hide evidence? We even have movies that illustrate I would that. Say every case. You know, like right. really. Like this is this happens. This is part of the system. And that's because and you say that, you know, the police, they're there to enforce the law. Well, yeah. They're you know, that that is the point. They're to enforce whatever laws and to protect capital, to protect the one percent. Protect the money. Mm -hmm. Serve. Absolutely. That's basically what they're doing. Absolutely. Job. I just want to go back again as to the timing, because what we are seeing in the streets in every town, whether large or small, mm -hmm. is this uh, rising, particularly of youth, right. rising up of youth. And <clears throat> it seems to me that it's the result of many things. It's the result of the, the fact that this economy, this capitalist economy, mm -hmm. has no future for literally tens of millions yeah. Yeah. of young people, Correct. particularly Correct. young people of color. Mm -hmm. And it has uh, nothing except the promise of a perhaps serving in a war mm -hmm. abroad as, as mm -hmm. it could be where it could be, or prison. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's being a soldier or being a prisoner. And I, and I think just the combination of all these things, and then the, it's just so in your face. Mm -hmm. There's no subtlety about the repression. Right. There's absolutely right. no subtlety right. at all. 
And so okay. I think that this timing, and we were going back to the influence that he has, um, he is not some sort of um, compromised right. leader. Right. Mm -hmm. right. He's not anybody mm -hmm. who has <clears throat> backed off. Mm -hmm. As unfortunately we see um, many other people who it's emerged of. out of the yeah, 60s right. and 70s mm -hmm. who may talk a certain talk mm -hmm. but don't seem to walk the walk. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, so again, so you've got a man who is uh, integrity personified, mm -hmm. who has uh, the ability to, to speak and say the truth, yes. but not just say it in a way that is, is, uh, goes over anybody's mm -hmm. head. Right. That's right. He really goes right Very to the heart of the matter. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. And he really addresses this. So why is this so important to the state of Pennsylvania and, and to the country or to the right wing as a whole and to the police? Because literally, there's nobody who, uh, if you ask them what their opinion would be about police, there's hardly anybody that will accord them much respect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. They right. may have fear, but respect is another word. Right. And so Mumia's case, you know, falsely convicted of killing a police officer in solitary for 30 years, everything the state could have possibly done to him, mm -hmm. and yet emerges as this clear voice. Yes. Yes. And yes. youth yes. asked for him yes. <laughs> right. to be yes. their <laughs> commencement right. speaker. So this is not like here's this figure from the past, mm -hmm. you know, that young people aren't interested in hearing right. from. Still relevant. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's, exactly. what, that's, that's, and that's why is. I think this yeah. law has come into effect. I, and I, I think it's been more. challenged. Yeah. It is totally unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, the main, I mean, I think the main thing is that, for example, technically, I don't know all the publishers of these books mm -hmm. all the radio stations that uh, including WRFG mm -hmm. that play Mumia's recordings mm -hmm. are we all supposedly potentially suable right. under this law right right we play, right. We right. play right. Mumia before right. the show right. yeah, they're going to be upset yeah. right. I ain't got no money I think that I, I, I'm sorry I, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't agree totally more I had a question though one of the things first I wanted to say about the police culture and especially understanding um, coming from a black man here in America and African people here in America, um, why a lot of, I feel like a lot of our people join the police force is because we're traumatized. It's like what you mm -hmm. said when the police officer walked up on you, you were fearful. Mm -hmm. It's we, we raise our children <clears throat> to be, to live in an environment of fear. Right. I actually have to raise my children to be fearful of death. Don't put your hoodie on, boy, when you're right. walking at night. Right. When you go into the store, take your hoodie off, raise your hands up. You know make sure you got some clean boxes there right. or something. Make, yeah, you, think about it. <laughs> right. hey, make sure you wear clean drawers because you don't know when you're going to go to the hospital. Who tells their child that? <laughs> no, you did not just say that. Yeah, you know, you make sure your drawers and your socks are clean, boy, because yeah, you don't know yeah. when you're going to go to the hospital. Right. Why we don't raise our children to go out to be successful? So this is the type of fear. This is the type of thing, you know, so now every day, my grandma's telling me that, so every day I go out, like, give me some clean drawers in case I got to go to the hospital. Who the hell thinks like that? I just want to go play, you know. So that's the first thing. So I, I think that a lot of times in being fearful of the police, that was like we said, if you can't beat them, join them. So right. a lot of black people, and because we are fearful of the police, you don't have to be doing nothing. They see a whoop in the rear view, and boy, you just going to shake, and you're like, yeah. don't anything. Oh, <laughs> you don't run the warrants, and you could be good. The secondly is we would talk about the timing and what's going on in Ferguson and everything like that. What what do we think that's happening? Do we think are there any progressive organizations um, that are ready to take this to the next level? And what is that level? Good question. Oh, as I'm thinking, the organization for Black Struggle, they've been doing it in Ferguson for real. You know, they've been, you know, they're the ones that um, helped organize the initial demands uh, that were set forward. Yeah, because Yang made a indictment. suggestion that we should actually march before the UN because you have countries like China and Russia saying, see America, yeah. human rights violations. So, I mean, if we... We need to go before the UN. Right. And then you got 25 countries that just back Mamiya. Right. Yeah, I think it should be... I have something oh. to point out about um, what you were saying about police officers. There's also something else, again, that, you know... In my job searches, you know, you notice basically what jobs are available. 
the military, and mm -hmm. the police academy. Right. And so some of these folks are people who are trying to get jobs and trying to work, yeah. and so they're trying to get this job right quick. But I think that you know we also need to note sort of like how many, when we're talking about cop culture, I, I'm glad that you say that. When, I, when you were saying cop culture, I was thinking about law and order. I was thinking about pop culture. Because mm -hmm. right. if you think about it, we got cop, we got cop shows everywhere. Yes. Right. And they're all good cops that you have to understand right. Right. who sometimes do brutal things to people, but they're very bad people. Right. And so we have to be sympathetic with them. And then on the other hand, you have people who need to work. And so, you know, there are people who figure, okay, I get some good benefits doing this. All I'm right. supposed to be doing good. And I think also self-hatred and white supremacy helps drive that yeah. you know you think there are people who need to be in jail and unfortunately a lot of those people look like you mm. you know and i think that's that's a very big part of cop culture but outside of you know when i think about jobs that are available you know why would somebody want to go be a soldier you know there's this rhetoric about how you're going to go you know protect our freedoms and stuff like that but really that's not what you're doing well, you know, there's Muslims out there and terrorists and ISIS and Al Qaeda. We got to get them. We got to get them. I tell you, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, the, so, the, so that's a culture. So, the, and and since we're, you know, we've been talking about the militarization of police and the mm. military, you know, considering, you know, they're snapping up a lot more people to oppress their own people. Yep. So that's, you know, that's, and and it was kind of scary to hear. Um, I think, uh, um, gosh, what is that man's name? I forgot what, what is his name. Um, he he said something about we need more black cops in Ferguson. Well, we don't need um, more black cops in Ferguson. Van said that. One no, one. no, no. It's uh, Lupe Fiasco. Oh, talk about we need more we need more cops in, in no, Ferguson. Black no, cops, cops that look like us. That's no, weird. it's like we have cops everywhere. Think about it. we're in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. We've got Marta police. We've got Fulton police. We've got Atlanta police. We've got Georgia yeah. State. You know, we've yes, got the right. Capitol. Mm -hmm. Georgia State has a full police force. Mm -hmm. When I first moved here to Georgia, the first thing I saw was a Marta police dressed up like SWAT. Yeah, I didn't know it was that serious on yeah. the Marta train. Yeah, it's not. Well, I don't think Lupe. We, I, 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 I hear what Lupe is saying. I think that the police have to, uh, uh, and I've heard this many <clears> times <throat> on WRG, be a part of the community. You know oh. what I'm saying? And, 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 and I, I'll pipe Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 please. Sure, sure. I think there can be, uh, you know, what we call democratic demands. Mm -hmm. Democratic demands say that, that the, the, all the opportunities should be available, you know, to everybody. But I think when we were talking about what you were, were mentioning, where is this movement going? And um, I mean, the first thing that's so incredible when you watch the pictures out of New York City yesterday, Boston yesterday, Chicago. Detroit yesterday, Chicago, yeah. Baltimore, DC, yeah. San Francisco, all over, um, you saw mm. one, a largely youthful crowd, mm. not totally. Mm. You saw a very varied <laughs> crowd. Yes. I love um, that. Um, and so you, what you saw, I, seems to me, is uh, the evidence of a change in consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. And yeah, it's, it's consciousness, consciousness on a couple yeah. of levels. It's obviously consciousness about the role of repress the repressive state apparatus. So that's right. a mm -hmm. kind of political term. And the repressive state apparatus is the police, it's the courts, it's the prisons, it's mm -hmm. the military. Right. But you also saw... Uh, I think a burgeoning sense um, of the power of mass action. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. yes. So I think people have been truly inspired by Ferguson, the people of this small area of St. Louis, who have come <coughs> out day after day, over a hundred and something days, mm -hmm. despite military tanks, despite right. rubber bullets, despite right. tear gas, yeah. right, despite right, right. The arrests. And, and I think that that has just sent the most amazing message, not, and not just to the youth here in the United States and people here in the United States, right. around Global. the world. Mm. Right. Mm. Around the world, mm. other people have held demonstrations mm. in relation to Ferguson and Eric I, I just want to say, and there's, <clears throat> there's no, you know, that's what I mean, but what, what is the next step after the mass protest? Right. Because no, no offense, in the black community, I mean, they, they, Ferguson didn't just get those. You know what I'm saying? The black right, community, right. we had, I had an incident where when I was going in the Panthers, 
they sent in a whole SWAT team. So a lot of people in these particular, we're accustomed to that. Yeah. So we do appreciate the kudos, the young people, kudos. But we've been having machine guns pointed in our face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've been having guns mm -hmm. put to the back. And what you're seeing is people, so we're saying we're tired of it. What I'm hoping is not happening is that that anger, that, 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 that um, frustration with repression and everything is not being co-opted. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Oh, a lot of times wow, yeah. in our struggles, we see mm. that we get a lot of organizations, they come in and they march us around 285 until we're tired. Mm. Ah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and then yeah. we're just tired. We go home, we have our Gatorade, we sit back and we watch it on the news. Man, turn on YouTube. I'm on YouTube. Right. I turn on Channel 5. Well, that's me laying right there. You see, <laughs> see my coat? So my next thing. for that. <laughs> this, <laughs> not me. You know, so my, my, my thing is, as as far as and this is out there to the leadership of these organizations and things that what is the next step one of the things that i love about the third development black panther party um is that they had you know one of the things that we do to inguza saba the kujakli self-determination mm -hmm. not only were they just you know they always showed the negroes with guns and things of that nature but they had an actual program f for us as africans here in america to be self-determinists you know what I'm saying, through political education and then taking that political theory and political ideology and translating that into some real practical solutions. So that's my question to all the, because what, 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 and, and I'm going to be brief, what happens to a lot of us, and I know y'all are going to say, well, this boy sounds like Bill Cosby. He comes hard on black folk. Uh -oh. So I'm going to have to come hard on black no, folk. No, you know, well, we'll see. You're coming, coming out of a place hard. of love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, it's coming hard. It's you're coming out of a place okay. of love. Because right. yeah, I'm coming out of love. What you love happening? blackness. Like I was in <laughs> Cumberland Mall. I was in Cumberland Mall, and I saw a, a, can I say that on there? I'm not trying to shoot out no advertising for them. But I was in the mall, let's just say. And I saw I I can't breathe shirt for sale. Yeah, in a store. You know, in the store. Oh yeah. You know, and so my thing was, are any of these proceeds going to Eric Garner's family, mm. or any of them going into any organization that is about progressive change? And this is what happens: we take, yeah. we have a lot of people that are um, get off on black misery, and especially from black people. When we went to the protest for Mike Brown, when I came down there, brother, they it was like a festival. Yes, it was. Brother, they got, you got your T-shirt. Got the Mike Brown T-shirts. <laughs> hands up, don't shoot T-shirts. Brother was selling me charges. Got them charging, bro. You know you don't want to miss no pictures at the thing. You got to keep your phone charged, bro. <laughs> Bottle of water. <laughs> it was a festival. I mean, that, that, right, that feeds kind of, into the capitalistic society. Exactly. Though. That's what you know I'm know saying. What I mean? So, like, I mean, so th that, that's my whole well, point. If we, don't, if, if we don't have sincere, and, and I'm going to be brief in my conclusion, if we don't have sincere leadership or sincere people with these protests, we have to... It's cool. The protests, the mass protests are great. But if they're not speaking to something in the long term, if they're not going to mm -hmm. go to something, then they're just going to burn out and black people suffer from amnesia. Six months from now, this will be like Troy Davis, like Sean Bell, like Oscar Grant, like uh, uh, Bia, uh, uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. You see what I'm saying? And we'll have old T-shirts like Troy Davis. Troy Davis, right. You see what I'm saying? So we have to make sure that this momentum continues and we're looking for some real changes. So that's my challenge to the progressive organizations out there. White or black and specifically you black organizations out there, what is your end game? I mean we gotta get legislation changed. I mean yeah. I hope I hope that's gonna be a end result of all this marching and protesting. I mean, because like they said on the news story the other day, they were talking about when they did the die in and yes. Macy's in in the I was there. Apple mm -hmm. or whatever. And they're like, what is that going to do? They're like, Macy's didn't do anything to you all. Uh, mm -hmm. iPhone and Apple didn't do anything to you all. Why are you going into these oh, stores having these <laughs> mass die-ins in these stores when <laughs> they were saying that they should be taking it to the steps of the Capitol? They should be doing it in, in the spot where Eric Garner got killed in New York. Uh, you know, but not, they're saying it shouldn't be in these Oh, of course All not. these big stores. Because, it's, because it's, 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 it's Right, and it's Christmas time, so they don't want to lose that revenue. That's why I think it's the I perfect think, place to do yeah, it. And I agree. Um, I think the, 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 the sentiment of these youth is, is we're not going to be channeled yes. right. there mm -hmm. to, to these legislators who are bought and paid for by the big corporations. The big, right. No, we're going to make life uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. it, it's, right uh, it's kind of the... The position that the anti-apartheid movement took in South Africa it was to make this system ungovernable. So, in other words, it, it they don't know where and when and how and things are going to pop off, but it's just not going to be the same as it was before. Right. I mean, so and that's what said pop off. And so, like he said, it has to be sustained though. Absolutely. It can't, like well. they were saying, uh, boycott Black Friday. 
and the rhetoric was, why are you going to boycott that one day and, and then, then go, shop the go shopping the next week on Cyber Monday or whatever mm -hmm. else for Christmas and all this other stuff. So it has to be a sustained movement with a um, long direct long-term goal that we want to see in the end. And it has to be legislation. Look, when Does they, it have to be legislation, though? How because there's a changes? oh we've got legislation that supposedly protect us that's not being Such used for it. hey well, you know no, I believe no one <laughs> <laughs> well, that, was not, that was not written for us but but the thing is is that a lot of times laws in this country are not written for us right right you know they're, they're trying but, to they're trying to they've been trying to knock off that voting rights but, act well, for well, a long time. have to make the noise to get the change in Congress, because that's what the FOP did. The Fraternal Order Police, yeah. they stayed on this Mumia thing. When they found out about mm -hmm. this Goddard College mm -hmm. commencement speech, mm -hmm. they went to the yeah, legislators and they right. were like, look, we got to do but, something about yeah. this. And so right. now, you know, Brett Grote, uh, his attorney, he says, being that the law is driven by the FOP, Fraternal Order Police, they're using Mumia to reestablish a propaganda line about police protecting good citizens mm -hmm. against thugs who hate America right. and want to rob them and who happen to be black. You know what I mean? He, he basically said it's a, it's, it's <laughs> right. He basically <laughs> said it's a power grab and that they feel threatened by constitutionally protected speech that challenges exactly. the Exactly. Wow. You know what I mean? It, 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 and this is coming from a lawyer. Go ahead. From, let me jump in there and do it. It goes back to the, when we were talking about the boycott, and I know we're running down on minutes, so, so I'm going to try to speak rapidly. Doing. We got to do the same thing. Accountability. Right. Accountability. Like the FOP. The FOP... They have, we don't have Africans here in America, we don't have lobbyists, right. we don't have, we spend our dollar with anybody, we right. don't check these corporations to find right. out if these corporations are sponsoring politicians who back legislation mm -hmm. that, you know, go for uh, uh, st uh, stiff uh, prison sentences that yeah. are directly oh, targeting yeah. us. That's right. The atrocities. We, we buy, spend our dollars with people, we don't know if they're supporting atrocities in Africa. So it has to be, for one of the things we have to do is accountable spending. I do like the fact that we sat in, fell in, laid in, sleep in into these retail stores right. and snacks. Shut this <laughs> down, <laughs> shut it down. down. You know, down. cause them, hurt their pockets. The only thing these capitalists understand is when you start hurting those pockets. That's true. But African people here in America spend a trillion dollars out of their community a year and it is unaccounted for. Right. Right. So we have to start holding these places that we spend, we have to hold them accountable and find out what they back and what they support. It's like Franz Fanon said, you can't tell a man how to fight, so we need for my revolutionaries, and I'm not a reformist, nor am I a radical reformist, I'm a revolutionary to my heart, but if we're gonna have people that are fighting for legislation, just like uh, uh, Huey Nam did, they took advantage of the loopholes in the Constitution. I understand what you're saying, that is not written for us, but they took advantage of right, those, right. you know, the right to bear arms mm -hmm. and things of this nature, and what killed them, yeah, they stormed on the uh, floor the the, the uh, 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 Capitol, Capitol building right. with with their guns, but uh, for the Bradford Act. But what killed them is they didn't have masses of black people going in there saying, "Yeah, you know what? Though no, we don't want that." You know what I'm saying? We don't want the Bradford Act. They didn't have anything to come behind that. They just stormed in there. It was a sensational action. It looked good, but they didn't have mass people. Even if those people were voting or what to go in there and say, "We need to repeal this law. We don't want that law because it keeps us defenseless." So you have to even in the in the course of our fighting. We know this document wasn't really written specifically for us, but if we can find loopholes in the document to sustain right. us until we can uh, further our advancement, further our fight, then we need to try to do that. Yeah. So I, I, I heard that you were talking about um, black spending power. Yeah. But I think there's something that, you know, there's something that a lot of black people don't notice. And, and it's basically that, you know, we do a lot of the work around here. Oh, yeah. Right on. Oh, you right know? on. Yeah. Right on. And we so there are too. workers everywhere. And so I'm thinking, you know, spend, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, I'm, I'm very much on the not fence as far as like spending power. But if they just withdraw their labor. Right. That is actually Ooh, going to interrupt. I, 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 I the Latino brothers kind of got that on lock right. now, but, but, but then know. think about it this way. You've got different workers, you know, you've got workers who are organizing now talking about, you know, this is, you know, these, these are we not all just happening in a yeah, circle. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got fast food workers yeah. that's right. who are fighting for $15 an hour. You've got people who are just like, well, let's, get, let's give it to them before they start this big thing, mm -hmm. before they realize that we do the work, you know? Mm -hmm. And well, so I'm thinking, which are labor? To the point that you just made, uh, last week I watched a Excellent movie from the seventies called "The Spook Who Sat by the Door." Oh, oh yes. man. Yeah. everybody needs Green to watch that movie. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, yes. The Spook Who Sat by the Door, and they spoke 
to what you might, this was made in the 70s, and they spoke mm -hmm. to what you just said. Um, they were talking about how after slavery was over, you know, because we were brought here to build a country, mm -hmm. and once we built the country, there was really no use for us. Read the King Alpha plan also. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the movie, he stated that after slavery and Jim Crow was over, there really was no, they, the government didn't want to keep black folks around. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned these concentration camps that they had mm -hmm. set up for us. Uh, but they couldn't execute the concentration camp plan because blacks made up 80% of the janitorial mm -hmm. workforce. Right. It made up 60%. That was in the 70s. Right, in the, the 70s. Yeah. It yeah. made up 60% well, of the, the hospital, you know, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So it, it's a, like you said, it's a large part of the mm -hmm. workforce. Mm -hmm. And like I said I don't on know. the show, well, think you don't about think, black think about are a large prison. Part of the workforce? Not think anymore. about prison labor Man. as well. How many? You know, we've yeah. got the most people in prison in the right. United exactly. in the United but they States. They can strike, but the, actually, but they have. They have. Here yeah. in Georgia, they yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, when they went on there, when, um, the, the and you know what? They, they withdrew their labor. They just went. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I just Let want me. to make a comment. You know, I'm a, among other things, I'm also a retired auto worker, so I'm a, a okay. union member for the UAW and UAW. And I think this is one of the big issues where you're talking about where is this movement going to go. And this seems to me we've seen um, a lot of people step forward. And, and I think there's just a lot of um, energetic leadership coming you know, from young people. I think that there does need to be some of the seasoned activists. And I'm not talking about people, the collaborative, mm. the collaborationist mm -hmm. seasoned Thank activists. Yeah, I'm like I am talking about the ones who sharp. have who have consistently, through their whole lifetime, been with mass struggle, been Brush always right. opposing the system, right. always been fighting for the rights of the people. So I think they can learn something from them. I particularly want to talk about, though, the role of unions. And, the, and even though yeah. there's a small percentage of workers that are in unions, nevertheless, it has great power. And this possibility, I mean, just think about it. If there was a general strike, you ask about how do we get something changed. Right. Mm -hmm. If there was an actual general strike in this country mm. that raised the issues of police brutality and police mm. repression, mm. Um, mass incarceration, mm. all these issues, because all those people behind bars, they are workers who either were did have a job or were unemployed. Right. Mm -hmm. None of them are owners of right. any big right. <laughs> right. 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 any right. big corporation. They are all workers. Uh, so I think this is just something, you know, as we go forward and seeing this, um, we all have to be there mm -hmm. with these youth. But I tell you, look, it's exciting to be is, out there. I have to tell you, it's all exciting. All I got to say is with this $1.1 trillion that black spending power that we have, we need to either start a group or fund some groups that can go in and push legislation that can get these laws changed because the FOP – got this right, the uh, RRA Act passed, it was voted on 197 to zero. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that means everybody, Republican, mm -hmm. the Democrat, you were talking about earlier, the Democrats for us, uh, as no, far they're as black not. people, yeah. <laughs> no, that's they're everybody. Not. So we gotta do something that can get a change effected in Congress, in legislation, and it has to be Gotta something. stick together, y'all. Yeah, gotta stick together, <laughs> unity is the first start. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that being said, you know, like I said on the it's last never show. Time, it's never, never enough time. Never enough time. I also want to mention that a lot of these organizers in Ferguson were women. Absolutely. Oh, hey. Queer women of color. That's I, right. you, and you got to love it. See, and, and that's what we were talking about. And you got to love it. That everybody, you know, and that's that's a good thing that everybody has to push their point. But that's a whole other show. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to come, yeah. come back for that one. You got to come back for that one. All right. Thank you for We out. Peace. Wah, wah. Free Mamiya! Free, Free Mamiya! Mamiya. <laughs> That's right. Look, All right. Brick by even, brick, wall by wall. Free Mamiya! Free the mall! Game for this man from the research yeah. that I've done. Oh, yeah. Like I just we were just talking about prison. that non, though. That conversation we were having. That um, and this is and this is why we said we have to get out there as, as black nationals to get out there more because everybody pushes. And no offense, I know it was black women uh, uh, of color. A lot of yes. Uh, they're What's doing that it that here in Atlanta. What's that got to do with Mike Brown? That uh, you know what? Mike